Hi everyone, Taya here from Quilting Delights and we are excited about starting our journey on the feather quilt and free motion quilting and ruler work with your Bernina BSR and compatible BSR ruler work attachments. We know that you guys have been waiting to get started on this and we have too. There's quite a group of you that are going to be joining us and whether you have a Bernina or not, it doesn't matter. We're just excited about helping you get along on your quilting journey. One thing I discovered 20 years ago was that I loved making big quilts, but I couldn't get them quilted because they were too big a project in my sewing machine. So to help you avoid that same problem, we're going to start with small projects and work our way up. So our first project here at Quilting Delights with ruler work and free motion is the feather quilt. It's called Under His Wings. The pattern is by Joanne Hoffman. And we are very excited to get started with this and show you a plan for quilting, show you how to create your own projects and give you really good skills on how to get this done and make it look just as good as you want it to. Thanks for joining us and here we go. We are ready to get started and I'm going to show you what you need to get started on this wonderful project under his wings. Taya here at Quilting Delights, thanks for joining us and let me go through some tools and tips and tricks that might help you get your projects done more timely. All right, first we're going to start with marking tools. There are lots of marking tools for quilting. One of them is made by Clover and there's another one by Bowen and it is a fine water erasable marker. For those of you that have used friction pens, um, you know that they sometimes can leave an afterline when you iron them. I haven't found that to be a problem long term, but I just want to give you some other options in case that's something that you're concerned about. My favorite tools are the Bowen and or the Sewline pencils. They're crayon, they're called crayon pencils. They're, they stay longer than chalk and they come in a light and a dark lead. Both of them take 0.9 lead replacements, so the lead replacements are interchangeable. If you are a Bowen pen owner and you can't find the Bowen replacement uh, um, cartridges, um, Sewline makes a 0.9 also and you can use theirs. The replacement cartridges or replacement leads are uh, interchangeable between those two. And these are one of my favorite, favorite tools. The reason I like them is because the sew line in particular has both black and white, so you're going to be able to mark on the light and the dark. Okay, so those are marking tools. The other thing that I want to make sure you have are good needles. My favorite needles are the Superior Top Stitch needles. The 8012s come in a blue package, the 9014s come in a pink package. I pretty much um, I pretty much only work with these. I use the 8012s for my piecing and I use the 9014s. The reason I like these is they're titanium coated. All that means for you is if you're doing fast quilting or if you're doing a lot of stitch regulating or a lot of free motion quilting, needles get hot and then they can bend and not keep their straight up and down. So having a titanium coating makes them last a little bit longer. You still need to put a fresh needle in every project, but these will help you um, keep going a little bit longer. Um, I have a full size iron and then I have a small clover iron for um, if, for example, my feather tips come up a little bit before I get them all quilted down, then I don't have to set an iron on my project. I can just um, iron down the little pieces. So having this clover mini iron is perfect for smaller applique projects, just keeping hot where you need the, the hot to be. One of the newer products that's out right now that we are really, really enjoying is what's called Rough It Up Tape. It's a non-slip, clear adhesive gripper strip. Now, here's what my experience has been with rulers over time. Whether it's an acrylic ruler and I'm using a rotary cutter or my thicker long arm rulers, I have a difficult time holding on to the top of the ruler. So now, this ruler tape goes on both the top and the bottom. And because it's clear and has a rough surface, it gives you a grip on the bottom side of your ruler, but it also lets you hold on to your ruler on the top. And this is called Rough It Up Tape. It comes three rolls to a package. The other thing that we are um, discovering is very helpful, and you'll see this when we get into setup here pretty quick, is the Tack It Down Tape. This is a paper tape similar to other products that are out there. But our Tack It Up tape is about half the price or less than other products that are out on the market. 
what's great about it is you can use it to tape down um, for example, if you're machine quilting and you have a flange or you have a piece of lace, you can use this to tape it down, quilt over it if that's what you want to do or miss it, and then just peel the paper off, um, paper tape off. It doesn't leave a residue. The other thing that this is really useful for is taping down your um, easy glide um, uh, sheet that we're going to put down to make our quilting surface super slick and it's nice to have it around the edges. Sometimes blue tape will leave a residue and I don't like that so this paper tape, um, tack it down tape, is a great product for um, tacking that down. It doesn't leave a residue when you're done. Alright, let's talk about um, doing the wonder under. Using the wonder under on your fabrics and your iron and your ironing board. Absolutely! Absolutely, do not use it without a pressing sheet. The pressing sheet is a non-stick, so anything that comes off the wonder under is gonna go onto your pressing sheet, not your ironing surface. So these come in a variety of sizes. They come in white or tan, and they are um, eight and a half by 11, 16 by 24. 24 by 24 is the one that I'm gonna be using on my surface. It's a good size. I have a, a cabinet that my machine goes down into. I want as much surface as possible and we actually have them 24 by 36 as well. So we'll talk more about those but they're a great product. They're multi-purpose product. Um, you can use it for ironing your web, uh, your um, fusible and not getting it on your iron or your surface. You can use it for collage quilting. I don't know how many of you love the Laura Heine collage quilting but this allows you to build on top of it. And if you're doing anything with Steamaseam or Steamaseam 2, if you've worked with that product, you know that as you heat it up, it oozes out from the paper. It gets everywhere. Just folding this over and heating up your Steamaseam onto your product um, keeps all of that mess off of your iron and your ironing surface. I can't, I, I just can't be more emphatic about keeping your iron and your ironing surfaces clean. Once you've used it and you've got glue and uh, fusible web all over these, we've got microfiber towels now that are the best ever, uh, in my opinion, ever found. Um, some of you have had the yellow microfibers that make it feel like it's tearing the skin off your hands. I don't like that feeling. These are super soft and very effective and all you do is get it damp and wipe your pressing sheet off and it's clean and ready to use again. So it's a great product also, uh, great uh, cloth for cleaning your the fronts of your sewing machines or um, actually I clean my glasses with it. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to, but um, don't use don't take that as advice. I'm just telling you they're super soft. Okay, so that covers this part of it. Um, I want to give you a couple of ideas too. Now, uh, many of you know about Karen K. Buckley scissors. These are, in my opinion, the finest serrated scissors ever made. And they come in a couple of sizes. This is the most comfortable size for me. It's the medium. And I've had these for, oh, I don't know, three or four years. And they're still incredibly sharp. The reason you want to use serrated on appliques is because it doesn't shred the edge of the fabric when you cut. So it's really important to have good serrated scissors. And my suggestion is that you make sure that you have straight scissors, not curved scissors for cutting these out. So Karen uh, K. Buckley scissors um, are a super effective tool. I keep the cap on mine all the time because they are so sharp you can actually hurt yourself and I, we, we don't want any blood on our projects so let's keep safe while we're doing this. The other thing I want to talk about is the, um, I think we used to have these for doing wallpaper but they've been repurposed by Violet Craft who's one of my favorite um, artists and designers and she repurposed these and brought them into the sewing and quilting industry for pressing seams. So when you're sitting next to your sewing machine and you have to put your binding strips together and you just have that little short seam that you need to press open, these are perfect. And I love these. I also want to share with you what my thoughts are on threads. So I have worked for 20 years with every thread company that's out there and I always fall back to superior threads for my quilting. And for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a good quality thread. It's a really good quality thread and it is a thinner thread, the same same weight as a 50 weight, but it's polyester. So when you are talking about quilting, you need the strength of polyester 
for quilting, but I don't want the sheen. So I, I don't want to use my polyester embroidery thread because I don't need my project to sparkle. I really like that flat finish thread. So Superior Threads puts out um, very large cones of thread. These have, let's see, 6,000 yards. I can do a lot of quilting with one of these. And the price is um, very, very cost effective for that much thread. The other thread that is awesome, um, I used to quilt with King Tut, which is also a superior product, but the problem with King Tut is it is too thick. And so it lays on the top of your projects. Now, I do like King Tut thread for quilting my flannel quilts, but I don't like King Tut for doing this kind of project. It's too thick. It's just gonna lay on top and we want these threads to bury. So the reason I used King Tut was because it was a really great variegated thread, but I don't, um, I don't use it anymore for quilting unless I'm doing flannel. What, what happened is Superior came out with an absolutely beautiful, um, thin variegated thread that is to die for. It's absolutely gorgeous. So it's called Omni V for variegated. So we have Superior Threads Omni and Superior Threads Omni V. All of these are listed on our website and um, all the colors that are available both in the solids and the variegated are listed on our website and available for purchase. So you can match your um, project, uh, match your threads to your project. Now for what we're doing, uh, when we get to the actual uh, physical putting it together, um, I'll give you some ideas on what to do and hopefully by the time we film the third class, I have the next project almost done and ready to show you. I'm very excited about that because our job is just to keep you inspired and wanting to do more with the quilting. Libby Lehman, who is one of my all-time favorite artists, used to teach at our store and she taught free motion quilting and absolutely beautiful art quilts. And she said, the way you become really good at something is you have to put 10,000 hours in. So we're starting right now with hour one and I'm hoping by the time we get to 10,000, all of us are very proficient. We can have our own little quilt show with our projects and showcase what we're able to do. We're very excited about being able to help you. Okay, a couple of other things um, that I wanna share. One is I was introduced to Cutter Pillar, which is a brand of light tables. I think they call them, what do they call them? Light boards, I think is what they call them. We've always called them light tables, but they're called light boards. And I bought this large one for my husband because he's a watercolor painter and he doesn't use the board that comes with it. But now that I'm getting into applique and doing all kinds of projects, I asked him if I could borrow his light table and he said, well, for five minutes, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to get a new one for myself so that I don't have to share with him. Um, they're such a fabulous board. Uh, Caterpillar, if I remember right, they make the largest surface and it comes with um, four different levels of light, four or three, two, three, off, three levels of light. And it also comes, believe it or not, with a rotary cutting mat. So if you have trouble seeing, or your vision is getting a little bit, um, a little bit out there a little bit, um, this is a great way to set up a background and you can literally see better what you're trimming and what you're cutting. But for our purposes, we're gonna use this for the applique and for setting up our feathers on our fabric. And you'll see what that looks like here in just a little bit. I put the pattern that we're working with under his wings. Like I said, I love Joanne Hoffman. Uh, this is not the first project of hers that we've done. Um, for those of you that have been with us for a while, we did a snowman one uh, last year. And what I did was, I took the snowmen and I digitized them and we embroidered them. So if any of you are interested in that, just email us at info at quiltingdelights.com and we can tell you more about the snowmen. They're absolutely darling. And they're in a circle, so they're really cute. And yes, we do have kits for those as well. So the cutter pillar tables come with the rotary cutting mat. They come in two sizes. This is the super large one. And then we have the um, premium one, which has a four hour battery life. This uh, premium and the um, original one that they have, I can't remember what it's called, but they're both the same size. They're actually half of the size of one of these large ones. So they do come with bags um, and you can just give us a jingle and let us know if you're interested in getting a light table. 
I love these. They, they come in a bag, I store them behind my cabinet, and when I'm ready to use them again, I just pull them out um, and use them. I will tell you though that you want to be careful. We have three golden retrievers, and I was working on these one night, and I had the cord stretched to the outlet, and along come the dogs, and they pulled the um, power cord out of my light table. So um, just be aware that um, it does. this one does have to be plugged in all the time. So just be aware and know that the smaller one has a four hour battery life and that just means you don't have to have a power cord hooked up to it um, when you're using it. One of my favorite other tools, and I look at these all of the time, are the Amanda Murphy ruler books, ruler book idea books. One of them is an organic free motion. One of them is an organic free motion and I don't know if that means that the paper is made organically or if the designs are organic. I don't know, but I love all three of them. We work mostly with the orange one and we're going to be working with this one quite a bit, but the other two books are also amazing and available. So um, those are just some ideas. Now, let's talk about rulers for just a second. Um, you all know that we like the Good Measure rulers and Amanda Murphy's rulers and they, the reason we like them is because they have a film on the back of them that makes it, makes it so that they hold on. And that is a really big difference and makes a huge difference. The rulers that we're going to be using in this project include the straight ruler, the every curve ruler, the oval, and the circle. Although for those of you that don't have an oval or a circle, I'm going to give you some helpful hints on how to make those if you don't have a ruler or if you're waiting for one. We've had every curve rulers and every circle rulers on order since early September. They shipped last week. Oh, I'm sorry, they shipped this week and will arrive here before the new year. So those will be in your boxes. If you have ordered those with your kits, those will be in your boxes when they come out to you. So you'll have everything complete and ready to go when we start our classes. But every, every curve ruler and the straight ruler, the good measure rulers are wonderful. We just have a hard time getting them from the distributor. And there's only one distributor in the country that um, manufactures and distributes these. So um, we're going to continue with those. I'll tell you also, I like working with so kind of wonderful rulers. They have only one kind of ruler, but it's an outside curve, inside curve, and straight line. And they come in two sizes. These are awesome. These do require that you get the rough it up tape because they're, sick, they're super slick on the bottom and on the top. So the rough it up tape, you can see I have it on here. And the rough it up tape makes it really easy to work with. The other ruler that I really enjoy, and you'll see this on a couple of the projects that I'm doing, is a Handy Gadget um, Wave D. I don't, know what I'm, I don't know what the other Wave ones are, but this is Wave D. And on this one, when I'm using it, I put blue tape for the reference line so that I can see where I need to line up my projects. And you'll see that when we start working on them. I have lots of other rulers. I have Westerly rulers that are fabulous. Um, there are several different brands. Um, the Copper Needle, which is, um, gosh, her name just escaped me. Gina, Copper Perk. Needle. Gina Perks rulers. Hers are fabulous as well. And what I like about Gina Perks rulers, um, you have holes in the rulers that help you hold on to it, that give you a grip too. So check that out, the copper needle. And I want to share with you, we have not been able to find any ruler racks that allow you to put the thicker long arm rulers in. And I don't know about you guys, but I can't stand storing my, uh, my rulers horizontally because I can never find the one that I want. But this now allows you to put your rulers in the slots. We are actually manufacturing these now. These um, allow you to put the rulers in the slots. I can stack them vertically from the tallest in the back to the shortest in the front. I can grab them just like that. We have a, a smaller size one that's um, roughly 6 by 9 8 by 10 something like that. Those retail for $25, and then this larger one retails for $45. They're made out of alder, beech, um, vertical grain fir, uh, we have a number of beautiful woods, maple, we have some maple ones. We have a number of beautiful woods that we are making these out of, and um, they're ready to ship as soon as you need them. I have probably 30 different uh, rulers, 
for long arming, and I just can't stand having them horizontal anymore. So I was very happy when we started manufacturing these. They're not available anyplace else um, that I'm aware of. If you are, let us know. We're happy to support other businesses as well. But we want to make sure that you guys can easily access your rulers. So the price is the same. The price is the same whether you are getting a long arm ruler with thicker slots or um, a regular acrylic ruler with thinner slots. Just let us know what your preference is, and you'll see these on the website as well. Okay, that's it for now for useful tools, and we're going to get started on our project next. Hi everyone, we've gone through supplies that you might want to have available and at the ready. I did forget to mention a pencil. Um, Joanne Hoffman in her pattern says to use a Sharpie pen when you're marking the wonder under. And I tried that and when I hit it with an iron then the Sharpie disappeared. So give it a shot. You're either going to need a sharp Sharpie, uh, as in a fine point Sharpie, or a good pencil that you can trace off your designs on. This is what we're working on is the under his wings. The nice part about it like this is you can either hang it horizontally or vertically. Now ours finished out about 24 by 36, I think is what, I think that's what I just measured. 24 by 30, something like that. But the template that, and so the fabric that we gave you in your kits is big enough to do a larger version of this. You have enough backing and binding to do a larger version if you want to. The quilting template is sized for 24 by 36, so we're going to leave it up to you to be creative and decide what size you want your finished product to be. Just because a pattern tells you a size of something doesn't mean you can't be creative and do what you want. So um, get those creative juices out and let's put, those, um, let's put those to work on our project here. Okay, I'm going to just roll this up and set it to the side so that we can go over what is in your box and how to set up your project. I really want you guys to be successful with this and I'm going to give you some helpful hints on how to do that. First of all you're going to have the pattern. We'll talk about that in just a second. You have got a lighter colored background and um, this is what you're going to place your appliques on and what we're going to quilt through. So here's what I can tell you about quilting that I'm aware of or that I've learned is whatever I'm quilting on, if it's not on a long arm, I really want that fabric stabilized. So we've given you a yard and a half of Shape Flex. Shape Flex is a Pellon product. Heat and Bond also makes this same product. And what it is, is a woven cotton, a woven cotton that has fusible on one side. And what we're going to do is we're going to fuse this onto the back side of your lighter fabric and it's going to stabilize that so that when we put the appliques on and start quilting your fabric doesn't shift and bunch up. One thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about supplies is that you really want either starch, which I don't use anymore because it flakes up, um, but you want to use some Mary Ellen's Best Press and if it's not a batik, so you don't have to prep your batiks. If you have batiks in your kit, you do not need to prep those because they don't shrink. By their nature, they don't shrink. But the cotton backgrounds and the Shape Flex Fusible, we want to prepare those with Mary Ellen's Best Press. And I'll be honest and tell you that I don't have a whole lot of patience for um, prepping. So what I do is, before I go to bed at night, I spray these down, uh, both the Shape Flex and the uh, background fabric. I spray them down. They're dry in the morning and I'm ready to press them. I don't have the patience to sit there and iron them dry and wait for that to happen. So that's one thought is you can um, spray them in the evening, go to bed, and they are ready to work with in the morning. Otherwise, um, when you're pressing the Shape Flex to the background fabric, make sure that you are ironing it on the Shape Flex side. In other words, turn your fabric upside down and put your Shape Flex on. Uh, there's a grittier side. The grittier side is the fusible that goes to the back of your fabric. It's absolutely fine that you just butt them up together. Um, you don't want a big gap between them, but they don't have to be overlapped. You can just butt them up as close as possible. Make sure everything is sprayed and pre-shrunk so that when you fuse these two together, you're not getting, um, you're just not getting puckering and that kind of stuff. But you want to iron from the back side, and here's why. I have had more than one time, um, we don't put water in our irons here in class and I don't put water in my irons at home. I use a spray bottle. But I have had irons spit 
And in fact, I'll show you on one of our other samples, I had an iron spit when I was putting these together and I thought, you know, I wanna remind you guys to please iron from the back side so that if it does spit, you have less of, you have less of this than what I have. So I don't know if you can see it there. Fortunately, it was on the corner, not on the inside. So I'm pretty sure that this is gonna get cut away when we're done, but you wanna make sure that your iron's not gonna spit on your project. So again, iron on the back side through the fusible and just be aware, whenever you put water into an iron, unless it's an ironing system like the Laura Star, um, you're, you're likely impossible to get um, your iron spitting. So just be really careful about that because these fabrics are beautiful that we've sent you and we want them to stay that way. Um, I'll talk about another little accident that I had here in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, all of my samples are uh, clean and perfect and beautiful, and we want yours to be the same way. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to prepare your background fabric by adding the shape flex to the back of your background fabric using Mary Ellen's Best Press on both of these. Then you can just set that aside, and your... Oh, I forgot to tell you one other thing that I want you to prepare with Mary Ellen's, and that is in your kits, you have a long strip of black fabric, that is gonna be the feather spine that goes up the center. And so we wanna prepare that with Mary Ellen's as well. We're gonna put a fusible web on this, but it is a cotton. So anytime you're working with cottons and batiks together, you wanna to make sure that you have prepared your cotton so that they have the same shrinkage as the batik. Batiks don't shrink by nature because they're already pre-treated in the batiking process. All right, so we can set those aside because they're already prepared. Then you have a 12 inch strip of fabric. And um, let me tell you why I'm going to ask you to do this. I want you to go ahead and prepare your binding strips in, and then roll them up into a little ball and set them aside. I cannot tell you the number of times over the years where I've said, oh, I'll do that later. And then, um, you know how long sometimes it can take to finish a project. And then I go to get my binding fabric, and guess what? I've used it up in something else. So if you'll just prepare your bindings ahead of time, and um, I put them in a Ziploc bag, and then I have a hanger, I have a closet where I put my projects as I'm working on them. I don't fold them all up because I don't want them crinkled. I actually fold them and then put pant hangers on. And then I hang the binding in a Ziploc bag on my, um, on my hanger. And then I know what goes with what. So go ahead and prepare these. Now for our lessons, what I'm gonna teach you is using two and a half inch strips and then I want you to sew them together with a bias seam. We'll, do, we'll show you that later. If you can just get your strips cut and put into a Ziploc bag, then we'll know that that fabric is safe and set aside for your binding. Okay, the other fabrics we don't have to do anything with right yet, but I will um, talk about that a little bit more. I'm gonna show you today how to set up your um, appliques because Joanne Hoffman does a really great job on um, on her patterns and I want to explain to you why I like her patterns and why I say that she does a good job. Don't let me forget um, you also have fusible fleece in your packet in your kit and you've got I believe you have uh, I don't remember how much we put in there but there's enough in there that you want to put once you get your sorry to go back to this but once you get your background prepared, I want you to put the fusible fleece on the back of this. So you're gonna have a layer of background fabric, you're gonna have a layer of shape flex, and then you're gonna have a layer of fusible fleece on the back of that. So it's gonna have a really nice weight to it for us to put the um, appliques on. So um, go ahead and get that prepared. The second piece of fusible fleece is going, to get, is going to get adhered to your backing. So you're gonna put that second piece of fusible fleece. Now, most of what we've sent out have been batik backings. And here's the thing to know about batiks. Sometimes it matters which side you fuse to, and sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't. Now this particular purple, if I'm looking at one side and then comparing the other side, it's pretty obvious which is the back and which is the side that you want out. So just take a look at that and um, pre-press these so that you have all the wrinkles out and then put your fusible fleece on the back side. So we're putting two layers of fusible fleece in our project and you will so appreciate that when we get to the quilting part because those two layers of fusible fleece actually hold on to each other and make the quilting process so much easier. So that's the last part of the prep. I'm sorry I forgot to tell you that. 
Okay, so now let's get to the actual um, cutting out and tracing of the feathers and what you want to do with that. So let me talk about Joanne's pattern. Some of you are good at reading instructions. I am not. I am, I think they call, I think I'm what they call a visual learner or is that kinetic? Is it a, I don't know. Anyway, I'm a visual learner. I don't read instructions, which is why when I first started quilting and I had sewn clothing for a few years, not successfully, but I had sewn clothing and everything in clothing, as you know, is a five eighths inch seam. So when I first started quilting, I looked at the pictures on how to put everything together, but did not notice that it was a quarter inch seam instead of a five eighths inch seam. So my queen size quilt turned into a lap quilt in a hurry. Um, you don't have to read a lot of instructions in Joanne's patterns because she does such a great job with her pictures and um, we're doing a video to help you. But um, I will say that um, reading the instructions before you get started might be helpful, but if you're not that kind of a person, then we'll just move on. Okay, love her picture. In her picture, she uses an ombre fabric, which means that it goes from dark to light to dark. And then she used the same fabric just for the feather on the opposite side. What I want you to notice, um, I'm going to pull my pattern pieces over here that I've already opened up and worked with. You want to notice, and this is why I love Joanne's patterns, she's the only designer that I'm aware of that gives you two sets of patterns, one to trace and one to place. So um, one of them is to trace the pattern, the other one is to place the pattern. Why is that important? Well, in this particular instance, it may or may not be because we're working with batiks, but when you're working with regular cottons or fabrics that have a, a correct side and a wrong side, you have to mirror image the designs. You have to mirror image the trace to get it to come out the same way that it is on the actual finished project. So what I love about Joanne's patterns is that she has given you one to trace so when you put it on the back of the fabric and then flip it over, it's going to look like her picture and it will fit exactly on the placement line. I love that. So the only thing that I'm going to have you add, so she says tape the patterns together. They will overlap about a quarter of an inch. Don't get crazy about this because it doesn't have to be a perfect alignment. It has to be close and you'll see why that's not critical. Um, when we get to the other side, but you do want to notice that on the trace this pattern, on the top feather pieces, I have put an L for left next to them. And on the bottom pieces, I have put an R for right. The first time I did this, I didn't put a left or a right on there. And I had a heck of a time trying to figure out which number five piece went where. So um, this made it simpler. Um, so on, once you get this all taped together, you're just gonna put an L across the top and an R across the bottom on all your pieces. And when you trace off your pieces, you're gonna put that same information on your traced off pieces. What I did was I traced off the spine first off of my one yard cut. So all of you have a one yard cut of Wonder Under in your packet. And I traced off the spine first and then set that aside. You're gonna trace these off and then trim around them maybe a quarter of an inch um, or so because we're gonna trim on the lines after we have ironed these onto our um, pieces of fabric. Then I just took the rest of what I had and I cut it into six inch strips so that it was easier to work with. And um, all of my six inch strips, I have a little bit extra. Um, which is nice. I didn't use it all, which means I maybe can figure out another one in here. But the six inch strips make it easier to work with when you're tracing off. And let me get the right one. When you're tracing off. And then you can mark. So here's number three. You can mark these. And um, don't forget to put left or right. It might seem odd to you that we're putting left on the right side and right on the left side, but remember, we're gonna mirror images and flip them over, so they'll be correct when they go on the other side. So we're gonna trace these off, trim around them, and then what I did was I set them up on a piece of fabric. Let me pull that over here. Hold on just a second. I set them up and pinned them to another piece of fabric. Now this piece of fabric has absolutely nothing to do with this project has nothing to do with the project. Um, and in fact, you would never 
iron these onto the right side of a fabric. This is a cotton, so it has a light and a dark. If you can see, it has a light and a dark. But it's a dark piece of fabric, and it allowed me to lay my feathers out and my spine out so that I can play with the color placement and decide what I actually want to put my fabrics, uh, what, what fabrics I want in the feather. So now we're going to take our feather pieces, and in this particular color palette, we are going to start with the teals, and we're going to go to the dark and to the purple. So I'm going to pull my darker purples out. Let me move this so that we have a really good flat surface to work with. I'm going to pull my darker fabrics out towards the top. Now, let me tell you something about piece number seven, uh, I'm sorry, piece number one left. It is, it barely fits on a two and a half inch strip, but it does fit. So you want to be careful when you're working with that one L strip to make sure that you get it all on, that you get the drawn parts all onto the fabric. Um, on this one, I like to work with the darker to the lighter. Now, um, I will tell you that there are 17 pieces that go up one side, and then there are 13 pieces that go down the other side. So, I, um, when I looked at this, I said, okay, which side do I want to start on? I know the lights are going to go on the bottom and the darks are going to go on the top and everything mid-range. And here's what I decided. I went ahead and did the, the ones that are marked left. I did the 13 first because we've given you, I don't know, 17 or 18 pieces, maybe 19. We've given you a lot. If you do that on this side, you'll have more fabrics that will rotate around. I don't know if that makes sense, but in other words, I'm going to have 13 pieces here, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then I'm going to start backwards. And what I don't want necessarily is for the same fabric to be on both sides. I want my colors and my fabrics to rotate a little bit. So what you're going to do is just pick how you want these to lay out, and then as you have a, as you have those colors aligned and assessed, then for example, I would put number 13 here. And since whoops, if the fusible comes off the back, don't worry about it. Just um, pin it back on. I would do this, and then I would cut this piece off and lay it here so that you can. Start seeing how these are going to rotate around for colors, okay? So you're just going to cut that off. Don't iron it on yet. Just cut it off so that you have it there. Make the best use of your fabric so that um, in case you need a big piece on the other side, you have that available. That's the other reason I started on this side. In quilting, applique, whatever it is you're working on, you always want to start with the biggest pieces first and work your way down to the smallest pieces because if you have to err anywhere you want to err on the side of having all the big pieces cut out first. Okay, so we're going to get all those pieces lined up the way you want your colors. And I just love this. Look how beautiful these are. Um, let me see. There's another one here. And I like that. Oh, here's a light one. Let's get that one out. Oh, two light ones. Okay, so maybe I'll put the light one first. Oh, I'm starting to see it. Yep, here's the light one. And then this one and then this one. So I'm going to put that piece back over there. And then, no, I like this one here. And like this, and a little bit there. So you can start seeing how that's going to transition into these other colors. I would definitely find, um, before you get too far into this, I would definitely identify what you want to be the darkest and the heaviest up at the top. So for example, you might do something like this. Well, you know, here's one that's even darker. So let's play with that and see if it doesn't need to be the kingpin of the whole operation here. That might be nice to have that pull both, both of the colors together. There you go. So there's my top. And then I'm going to start working my way down the sides and um, seeing what I want to do there. And there's a purple... So we can um, feather these, you know, we can feather the colors in, so to speak, 
and um, make it look really great. So once you get your colors situated, you can go ahead and pull these off, iron them onto the back side, the wrong side of your fabrics, and then go ahead and trim them out with the K Buckley, making sure you keep the left side and the right side separate and available. And don't forget to cut your spine out too. Okay, we're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. Hi everyone, welcome back. By now you've had a chance to cut out all of your feather pieces and your spine. And I wanna talk about what the next step is. Um, this is probably the thing I struggled with the most on setup. And I finally realized the reason I was struggling with it was I didn't know where my final area was gonna be. And so it didn't matter how I set up the feather, it just didn't feel right. So what I did was I took my background piece and I don't know if you can see it on here, but I actually marked a 24 by 36 inch rectangle. Now, if you wanna make yours a little bit bigger, whatever size you wanna make it, just get a rectangle on here so that it gives you some perspective on where you want your feather to land on your work. I wanted mine at an angle, and so you can see that the, the fabric is square to my cutting, or to my light table. My fabric is square to my light table, so my edge of my fabric runs right here or I can move it up and it runs right here. It just gives me some place to line up um, so that I can get this figured out where I want to place it. Then I wanted my feather to curve. Well, if you put the paper underneath it straight on, it doesn't curve. If you put the feather paper straight on, what you get is a feather that goes straight across. Well, I didn't want that. I wanted mine to kind of be at an angle. So I tipped it until I could see that that was how I wanted it. I wanted the bottom to be a little bit um, farther down and tipped and now I've got it square to my work and that's exactly where I want to position it. We're going to start at the bottom. Actually we're going to start on one side and go up and then down to the other side. Now remember we marked these with a right and a left on the tracing and now when you go to place them they're going to be correct and ready to go. So you can see how that um, marking them right and left really makes a difference. I don't think it matters um, all that much whether you do one side or you do from the bottom to the top. That's, I think, just up to you how you wanna do that. I just wanna make sure that you can see that it needs to be straight. You need to have a straight edge that you can work off of. So that's why I marked mine with the 24 by 36 or whatever size you wanna mark that. And then it allowed me to position my um, paper, my placement paper underneath, and then I started from there. You can see, hopefully, you can see that it really does make a difference having a light underneath this. Let me show you the difference without a light. It's harder to see what um, where you're supposed to position these. So having a light table or a light bar, I don't remember what they call these, light table, I've always called it a light table, um, makes a big difference in um, being able to see placement of your project. Okay, so now you've got all your pieces positioned and Pretend like we don't have the spine on here yet because we want to get everything else down first. What I do want to make sure you understand is that it's really important. Let's see if we can see it from the back side. Nope, we can't. It's really important that you match up your center pieces as close as you can without overlapping them. If you overlap those center pieces, it will cause a ridge in the center of your spine. So you want them as close together as possible without overlapping. Um, Joanne does a really good job showing this in the pattern, on your placement pattern. So you want to look at the two or three things that she comments on here. One of them is um, number nine on the right hand side. You want to notice that number eight comes after number nine and then you add number seven. So she gives you specific instructions, but please note in the center of this that the um, spine or the feathers that you've cut should line up right next to each other but not overlap. Overlapping creates a lump in the middle of that spine. Once you've got these positioned, um, there is a tef uh, I'm sorry, there is a uh, tempered glass top that you can purchase in addition to put underneath this so that you can iron. 
But remember I said that I like my little clover iron? And the clover iron, what I do is I just barely tack these down with my clover iron because you don't want to heat, you don't want to put heat on your light table. But I need these to stay in position so that I can get them moved over and um, ironed down. So I just lightly tack down with my clover iron when I get these positioned. And then I tack down the spine. And then I take the whole thing and I pick the whole thing up and I take it over to my ironing board and I give it a really good press. Now, if you're dealing with light background fabric, my suggestion to you is that you take a piece of muslin and you lay it on top because you need to heat these enough for the fusible web to melt. I have one of my samples that I'm getting ready to quilt and all the edges of my feathers are peeling off because I didn't iron it enough. The other thing that you can, so you never want to iron on the top of your project without a, a piece of muslin. And you can also use your pressing sheet, the one that we're going to use for quilting, and the heat will transfer through this. It takes a little bit longer, but it will protect your project from any residue off your iron and any spitting. The other thing you can do is you can press it from the back side. Again, make sure that you've got some kind of fabric between this so that you're not um, having any um, damage to your project from your iron. Once this is ironed down really well, the last thing we're going to do to prepare before we go and have a, a cup of hot chocolate or a glass of wine and relax, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to add the fusible fleece to the back of our feather and to the back of our backing. Now the fusible fleece is a little bit bigger, which is fine. I'm going to show you a trick about that. Well, I guess it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Um, and you're going to iron this down. Now the fusible fleece will iron down better if you spray a little bit of water, like a spray bottle of water, and the steam when you hit it with an iron is what will make it adhere to the back of your project. What I can tell you is doing it from the back side is going to be the best, but here's the issue. When you press fusible fleece, the iron will melt this because it's polyester. So once again, you want a piece of muslin or your pressing sheet. Spray it with um, some water to get it to steam up and then open up your pressing sheet and you want to make sure that this adheres really well. But you can't put an iron on the fusible side because it's polyester and it kind of sticks to your iron. It's not very, it's just not a good deal. So make sure that you've got either a piece of muslin or your pressing sheet on the back side. I think it's easier to press from the back side, but you decide what's going to work best for you. Once you have the fusible fleece pressed on the back of the feather part of your project, you're going to do the same thing on the backing. You're going to press the fusible fleece to the wrong side of your backing. Once you've got the fusible fleece on the back of the feather and on the back of your um, backing, then trim around. Make sure that you trim the fusible fleece around to the edge of the fabric. Why do we want to do that? Because at some point we're going to iron these again and when you hit that fusible fleece with your iron, it has fusible on it and it's going to be messy. So you might as well just go ahead and trim that up and make it nice and clean. Once you have those two things done, my suggestion is that you set it aside, have a nice day or two between prep and getting started, and enjoy, enjoy your success with this part of the project. We're very excited to get on to the quilting and setup part, and we will look forward to seeing you at our next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash quilting delights to get notified of any other videos that we are posting. Like us and subscribe. We look forward to seeing you soon.